Okay, good afternoon, everybody, people in this room here in Dornish and out there in VC. You're all very welcome to this round table on tourism in the Highlands, past, present, and future. My name is Professor David Worthington, and I'm going to be keeping fairly quiet here, but I guess I've got to steer things a bit. So, we have four speakers today who are going to introduce their topic. Each one is going to speak for five minutes. And then after that, you'll have a chance to ask questions. I'll try and balance questions from the audience who are in here in the room with people who are out on the VC. Um, so, um, before I introduce speakers, I just had an example. I was looking at myself. A man called Thomas Kirk from Yorkshire came to the Highlands in 1677. And he came to Dornoch and he found the cathedral had um, no roof. Uh, he spoke to people locally about second sight. He then um, appeared to get a, into a bit of a political uh, debate somewhere around Invershin. Not quite sure about that, but he was accused of trying to chop down trees there. Um, he was, seemed to be quite glad to leave because he got to the Nig Ferry, Nig to Cromarty Ferry, and he was put on a boat with three horses, all of which were complaining profusely throughout the journey, and they almost turned back. So. Thomas Kirk may not be a typical tourist in the Highlands, I don't know, but hopefully we'll hear some different ideas about tourism in the Highlands uh, today from our four speakers and from you, the audience. I really want to hear your thoughts. I don't think we'll have a chance for everybody to speak today, but hopefully we'll have a chance to have chat questions, which will be relayed to our esteemed panel. So I think I will introduce them as they speak rather than introduce them all now. Um, and our first speaker, is Julian Grant, and Julian is a PhD student at the Centre for History, doing a really terrific cross-disciplinary PhD on, effectively, on the North Coast 500 group, but taking different perspectives on that. So I think I'm just going to pass over to you now, Julian, sure. and give you your five minutes. If you don't stick to your five minutes, I will make some signs and gesticulations that you're thinking. <laughs> your time's up. <laughs> uh, well, it's good to be here um, with a, a virtual audience, which is something we've all that we're used to, um, but also uh, an in-person audience, which we're maybe less used to these days. Um, so my name is Julian Grant, and as David said, I'm a PhD student affiliated with the, the Centre for History here at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, and I suppose my, my academic background before this PhD was as a, a social historian uh, with a particular interest in the themes of place and community. And within that, sort of examining how those themes of place and community play a role in times of stress and transformation in local places. Um, so, for example, my undergraduate dissertation looked at the decline of the fishing industry in the East Nuka Fife after the Second World War, and, and then looked at the repercussions of that decline for the, for the local community. Um, following on from that, my master's dissertation looked at community activism in, uh, in the form of residents, housing associations, and community centers uh, during the, the urban crisis of the 1970s in the neighborhood of Glasgow. Um, and then for this PhD, uh, I've taken those same themes of, of place and community, um, sort of taken them out of the past and into the present by focusing on an ongoing topic of critical social importance, uh, which is the issue of tourism and its impact on local communities here in the, in the North Islands. So I began my PhD um, three and a half years ago, coming to the end of it, um, and it's entitled People, Place in the North Coast 500. Um, for those of you who are not already aware, thinking of audiences abroad perhaps, um, the North Coast 500 is a 516 mile long coastal touring route um, which stretches from Inverness north to John O'Groats, west to Cape Wrath, down the west coast and, and circling back to Inverness, or if you so please, in, in the opposite direction. Um, and it was launched in 2015 by a company called North Coast 500 Limited, who uh, promote the route and hold the trademark to the route. Um, it's backed by big investors and has some really high profile sponsors, and it's been hugely successful in, in some senses in terms of reaching a huge global audience uh, and driving a real uptick in the number of visitors to this region. But as anyone who lives in the Highlands and Islands will know, it's also a very contentious phenomenon. So on the one hand, you have people who highlight um, 
its economic benefits, maybe pointing towards uh, the investment and income that it has brought to North Island communities. On the other hand, others um, voiced concerns over a host of problems which we associate with the term over-tourism. So that would encompass um, stress on rural infrastructure, overcrowding and littering, um, rural gentrification, pressures on housing, in particular affordable housing for local people. Um, and then these tensions intersect with uh, perhaps less concrete, but no less significant concerns, how the people and places of the North Highlands are represented in culture and media and marketing, and who is involved in the process of promoting and benefiting from tourism. So in order to engage with this really complicated terrain, I, I worked with local heritage organizations in three locations around the route of the NC500. So one in, in Castletown in Caithness, which is where I've lived for the past few years, one in the seaboard villages of Easter Ross, and the third on the, the west coast um, in Asset. And in each of these locations, with the support and guidance of, a, of my local collaborative partner, I developed and implemented community generated photography projects where local residents use disposable film cameras to document their relationship with the place in which they live um, and their sense of heritage and also reflected on tourism and its impacts on their lives and their sense of place. And then we work together to curate um, public exhibitions using the photographs which these participants took and using captions which they wrote to accompany these images. Um, and these exhibitions have been going up online and also in physical spaces with an eye towards reaching broader audiences, both locally, but also for those who travel um, to the region to do the North Coast 500 and perhaps might not be aware of some of the issues at play concerning tourism. Um, it's been a, a fascinating and rewarding process and I've gotten to know some amazing people with lives very different from my own uh, in, in a great amount of depth through this participatory research method, which allows me to travel with the participants as they very literally document their point of view over the course of their, their daily lives. Um, my challenge now is to craft that into a written PhD thesis, but at the end of the day, I'm very, very um, grateful for this opportunity, I suppose. I'm, I'm grateful firstly to the local community organizations and individuals who've contributed so generously to my research and, and my life, I suppose. Secondly, to my uh, supervisory team, who've been hugely supportive um, over the past few years. And I suppose I'm, I'm grateful as well for the opportunity to, to have lived in and immersed myself in the, the complicated realities of this part of the world at this moment in time. Um, and the, the sort of unique stresses and advantages that tourism brings. Um, so I invite you, if you find yourself in Castletown or in the seaboard villages or Assen, to go and have a look at the, the photography exhibitions which have emerged out of these research projects. They are either already um, up for viewing or soon will be. And if you're not in this part of the world, then have a look online. Likewise, they'll either already there or, or soon will be. Um, I'm really grateful for the chance to be here. And I'm looking forward to the conversation with my fellow panelists and with audiences near and far. So thank you very much. That's terrific. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. And um, we'll definitely pick up on some of the points you've raised. So our second speaker is going to introduce their research is Alexandra Dole, who is researching the Outlander series. So a very different view on tourism in the Highlands, the Outlander uh, novel series. I'm not an expert on it, but I should be. And uh, she is going to talk a bit about that in her research, which has taken place in broadly the same chronology as Julian's, been deeply affected by the pandemic. But over to you, Alex. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, uh, I just go by Alex, that's easier. Um, and basically, I think I started about six months after Julian, um, and we started off talking about how we both want to look at tourism and me kind of looking at literary tourism, especially in the Highlands. Um, and when the pandemic hit, the tours that I have planned, walking tours of Inverness, Outlander theme, they just didn't happen. So I kind of had to change it. So my research now is very much focused on the Outlander novels and how it's kind of being used there. But 
the first year I've done tons of research into tourism um, until all of a sudden tourism was dead. Um, so um, I'm really happy that I was asked to come in today uh, and still speak about tourism, even though it's kind of a bit taken us, but it's taken a bit of a step back in my PhD. Um, but yeah, it's still really relevant and important. So, first of all, for anybody that doesn't know Outlander, um, I know that there's probably a couple of people in the audience that uh, have seen my tweet online about it, um, and it's been retweeted by the author Diana Gavalden. So, it's gone kind of a bit viral. We've had uh, 21,000 impressions. So, 21,000 people have seen this event and know about it. Um, not everybody has called in, obviously, but um, <laughs> so you can see how quickly this kind of reached many people. Um, so it's a broad phenomenon um, and we've chatted a bit beforehand and not even all the panelists know what it is. So I'll give you a quick idea. Um, it was first written in 1991. The first book came out then um, up to today. We're at nine books uh, with the last one that was published last year and one more book to go. Um, and there's a TV series that started in 2014. It has six seasons and the seventh one is being filmed just now. So Outlander is about a World War II nurse that is on holiday in Inverness. So perfectly fitting for today's topic with her husband, Frank. Um, and Claire goes out um, and for whatever reason, we don't really know how it works yet. Maybe it will be, will be revealed in the next book, but she time travels through a circle of standing stones. Um, the standing stones are completely fictional, but you can find them all over um, Scotland. So it is possible to do um, <laughs> if you, I don't know, if you believe in it and are there in a specific time frame. But basically, Claire travels from 1945 back in time to the Scottish Highlands in 1743 where, of course, she meets a very good looking uh, <laughs> Highlander called Jamie Fraser. Um, she's a bit in, in turmoil over her husband she has in the future. She wants to get back to him. But as those romance stories goes, Jamie wins her heart. And we then, through nine books, follow their love story, first through the Jacobite Rebellion and then uh, through the American Revolution. And it's tons of history there. I could talk about it all day, but just this is the first idea. So. The series, the TV series really is what kind of kicked off Outlander tourism. There have been people doing tours kind of Outlander focused before, but not as much. So in 2015, there's already um, articles published by Visit Scotland saying, oh, this is this is potential to go somewhere. And by 2017, Scotland had become the most popular park to visit um, in the UK all over the world. Um, and we're still in the spot. It hasn't changed. The author Diana Gabaldon has won a tourism award for her contribution, and we generally speak of the Outlander effect when we mention this. Um, so I guess my part in this discussion is kind of bring in a popular culture point of view, um, people who come here for this book, but stay for the history and come back because Scotland is a great country and especially the Highlands as well. The issue with it, I find personally and why it fits into this discussion is the series is completely filmed in the central belt around Glasgow and Edinburgh. All the characters speak in a central belt accent. If you've ever been to Inverness, you'll know that Inverness, the Indonesian accent is very clean. Um, it doesn't sound as Scottish as maybe other accents do. Um, so we have lots of visitors coming to the central belt visiting filming locations, and some make their way up to Inverness, especially Culloden Battlefield. Um, but there's kind of where I see the problem. We've not academically watched the space for Inverness yet. So how has tourism changed because of Outlander? Um, and I've written down a couple of notes um, or numbers that were collected by the Moffat Centre for Travel and Tourism Business Development, which is part of Glasgow Caledonian U University. Um, their research covers 2013 to 19, so just before the pandemic. Um, and I want to give you three kind of locations that are Outlander relevant. First of all, Culloden Battlefield, they've had um, within these six years, they had a 100% visitor increase. Um, there is Dune Castle, which is used as Castle Leo, which some of you might know from Monty Python. Um, and that had um, roughly rounded up about 200% of visitor increase. And there's New Hales House, which has literally had the tiniest role in it. There's a big ball, so lots of carriages draw up in front. People get out, the carriages go away. That's the scene in the series. Um, 
and they have had an increase of 1,315% within six years. So that's from about 3,000, 4,000 visitors a year, we've, we've gone up to over 65,000. So you see the outlander effect is there and it's measurable. Um, but like I said, there's no info about any visitor numbers to Inverness, to the Highlands, because um, I believe if you make made your way to Inverness, um, you will then go to Bewley, which is a really important place in the books as well. Um, we have all the historical characters. There's graves, there's uh, places they have been. So it's really interesting to visit. And I believe if you find uh, the information about this and um, kind of pull out the information, you can then use it to possibly market Inverness and the Highlands as more of an attractive place um, that, you know, you say, Jamie and Claire, the fictional people were here, but you're here in reality and you can experience all of this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by it and I look forward to talking about this a bit more. Thank you, Alex. And yeah, really clear, interesting, important presentation again. And I was really keen to foreground the PhD students in our discussion today, because they're at the cutting edge of the research. And I think it's really exciting to see what you've been doing, especially in the context of the challenges of the last few years. I think it's really impressive the way you've adapted both of you, your research to, to fit that and to make it work for you and for people reading the work. Um, so we're now going to move to um, Dr. Steve Taylor. And Steve is the director of the Centre for Recreation and, Recreation and Tourism Research at UHI West Highlands, to give it its correct name. Now it's changed names. Um, in Fort William, and Steve um, brings us a different perspective on tourism. So over to you, Steve. I do. Uh, yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. Thanks very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, yes, I'm based at West Highland College, or as it used to be, um, in Fort William, and um, so I lead a, a, a small team there, a relatively small team um, of, of researchers and project officers who mostly get involved in uh, transnational uh, industry-facing projects. Um, we do some academic research, but that's not that's not a big part of what we do. So uh, yeah, a lot of what we do um, is, is is very much in terms of in the realms of knowledge exchange, I suppose you would say. And those projects cover a range of um, a range of tourism subjects. So um, initially, more on adventure tourism we used to um, look explore, but more recently, um, it's been on maritime tourism and cultural heritage. Um, but the, but we do cover quite a wide spectrum of, of tourism issues. Um, current projects include um, scientific tourism, for example. Um, so um, I'm just going to quickly talk about something um, that I think is very appropriate to today's discussion, and that is um, slow tourism. And in particular, um, I'm going to talk about slow adventure because slow adventure is very close to my heart. And it's close to my heart because I've kind of been involved in it since about 2014. And so slow adventure, it basically emanated as um, an academic concept. So one of my colleagues wrote a paper on it, or two of my colleagues wrote a paper on it back, back in those those days. Um, and we then took it to um, in, into into um, a different realm, really, which was to get funding and think about it as a marketing concept, whether whether we could actually make make some mileage out of out of what we felt was a great brand, potential brand. Um, and so work with businesses to think about uh, collaboration and clustering and also to think about um, extending their marketing reach um, using the slow adventure brands um, to to market um, to uh, sell and to develop uh, i guess what nature-based packages um so so that was the kind of background so it's it's had this kind of just gestation over a period of about six or six or seven years really and the project finished back in 2018. So anyway, slow venture, um, yeah, it's the opposite of what we what we understand as kind of adventure sports, really. Um, so it's 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 really very much about human or nature powered journeys through wild environments. Um, it it incorporates lots of different elements like wild foods, local foods. Um, it has quite a big educative um, element to it about cultures and environments, um, and it's about making people um, feel comfortable. In, in the outdoors. So if you look at it as a uh, as an academic concept, it has four key themes of time, uh, nature, comfort and passage. So it's it's about spending time in nature. Um, it's about the you know that actual physical passage through nature. 
Um, and it's about being comfortable in those wild environments and even being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's about these kind of slow, experiential, immersive journeys. Um, it's, it's about um, being connected, but being connected with, you know, with nature, um, a kind of, you know, completely different take on our, our current understanding of being connected. Um, and after the, the academic um, project and then, and then the applied project, um, there, were, there was so much interest in, in Slow Adventure. Um, and we, we did we did create a, a snail focused logo and we trademarked that. Um, and um, but we took it to various trade shows um, as part of the project and, and there was a, a real appetite, I think. It, it struck a chord with businesses um, and with destination management organizations. And, and and we felt there was something there was something there. Um, we particularly felt that it had some mileage when the European Travel Commission, which represents um, pretty much all of the destination management organisations across Europe, approached us out of the blue and said, you know, we really like this idea of slow venture and we want to use it to, to help promote uh, European tourism to the rest of the world. Um, that's something that's taken, uh, well, it, it's kind of been put on hold a bit because of COVID. Um, but when we had this approach, then we realised that, you know, this, okay, maybe the, there is something here. So. Um, we initially looked at uh, creating a spin-off company that was a cooperative um, because we felt a not-for-profit would be the right way to do it. It kind of fitted with this kind of ethical focus. Um, but then as soon as we uh, started talking to, to people um, about getting investment, uh, it was clear that we had to make it a for-profit because nobody wants to invest in, in a cooperative. They want to make money, obviously. Um, so, so yes, we, so Slow Venture Limited was spun out of this, this project. It's now an independent company. Um, and it was basically created to work with um, a range of micro businesses, suppliers across Europe through a, a series of local agents um, and th that kind of, you know, th those, those layers are, are really important. Um, and so at the moment, it's, it's, it's recently launched a series of products in Sweden, Scotland, Italy, um, and surely Iceland. Um, and uh, these are very, um, yeah, very, very sort of more, more, more high end products that are targeted at a certain, certain customer. Um, and um, the, uh, the experiences that are being developed at the moment um, are, are looking at a number of different, uh, different countries. So we're hoping that Finland and some of the partner countries that were involved in the, um, in the original project um, will be involved in that. Um, and hopefully you know, um, in time, then we'll be looking at taking this across, across the world really. Um, so in this way, Slow Engine, the company is like an ethical tour operator. Um, I mean, it's it's a small form of regenerative tourism, um, which is probably something we might touch on a bit um, in this discussion because um, it's uh, it's about giving something back. So it, it levies a five percent charge um, on on the price of experiences, and that, that goes towards local conservation schemes, whether that's environmental or or, or through communities. Um, and I think it's I think it's pretty much in tune with thinking these days on, on the tourism sector. I mean, there, there's been so much said, um, you know, during COVID as to what tourism might look like after COVID, um, whether that's going to come to pass or not, I don't know. But I think for a lot of consumers then, it ticks boxes in terms of the, its approaches. You know, it's a responsible approach, it's an ethical approach, um, and kind of sees slow venture. And, and you know, as part of the, the wider slow tourism family as being, um, it, it's, it's an ethos really, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of thinking, it's a philosophy and it's about um, connecting like-minded travellers um, with micro-businesses um, and engendering this kind of newfound um, respect for, um, for the communities and for the environments uh, in which you find yourself as part of these packages um, and supporting micro-businesses really um, who are collaborating together to, to produce the packages. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's felt to be a product of its time. And I think, I think hopefully it's, it's time has come. Um, and yeah, I absolutely hope that it's going to be, be a success. And I think, yeah, it'd be a, a nice, a nice, uh, impact study for, for, um, yeah, for, for future research exercises. So I'd like to go too much about those. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, we're very much trying to balance today, um, perspectives of researchers on tourism. With perspectives from tourism providers and from those engaged in that, and I'm sure lots of people attending will be from the the second category. So brilliant, thank you, Steve. We'll come back to that. Um, talking of being comfortable with, with the uncomfortable, 
uh, nothing to do with you, Professor Sidney, but uh, that's my attitude. When we get to the past, that's where I, I'm quite happy to get out of my comfort zone in that area. But I, Professor Annie Tindley, I'm going to have to dig myself out of this hole myself, is uh, a long friend of the Centre for History, a long-time friend of the Centre for History. She's Professor of British and Irish Rural History at the University of Newcastle. She's published a lot in the area of the history of land reform and landed estates. And I'd be really interested to hear your perspectives now, Annie. Thank you, David. Uh, and thanks um, to fellow panel members. Um, it's so it's such a privilege to go last because I can draw on all your expertise and brilliant thoughts. And, and thank you uh, for coming here in person and uh, online as well. Um, so, as David says, uh, I'm, a, I'm a historian, so a time traveller of sorts, so less glamorous than uh, your time tra traveller self. Um, and, um, and although I'm sort of a, a historian mainly of, from about the late 18th to early 20th century um, rural Scotland, principally the Highlands uh, and a bit in Ireland too, um, and I suppose what was kind of really interesting to be part of this panel and think about is thinking about thinking about that historical perspective on tourism, not just the history of tourism, but how history is used within tourism and how that's changed uh, over time. I suppose we can all, we all know that history is a powerful element of tourism, not just in the Highlands and Islands, but in other parts uh, of, of the UK and Ireland and, and all over the world, as, as, as Steve knows far better um, than I do. But I suppose you might ask, and I guess this is what Julian is asking is is whose history is that and and to what end is it being used and i think this is the element that has changed so much and will continue to do so and i was struck by what you said about um stress and transformation as kind of a key theme uh, that runs through some of this and um, so rather than if we look back and picking up on david's example that he opened with if we look back to tourists and tourism we what happens, for example, if we replace that word with that of traveller, which is how people before the advent of mass tourism would have seen themselves as travellers and adventurers, slow adventurers as well in the, in the 18th century, travelling by, by, by horse or by, um, by carriage. Um, and, and there's how long a history there is of those travel writers and visitors to the highlands and islands and how how their recorded impressions and um, judgments and the meanings they imposed on the people and places they encountered on their travels and then often published about how far that still influences our thinking about this region and what tourism means in the modern sense uh, in this place. Usually um, the emphasis these travellers placed was on the differences, so the differences of the language, the culture, the landscape. First, that was often negatively, so complaining horses on the ferry to make <laughs> or awful mountains. Um, and that changed really in the 19th century, famously with um, the writings of Sir Walter Scott, and, but before that, of course, Johnson and Boswell, into a much more kind of positive image of the beauty, the romanticism, the sort of sublime landscape, and um, that could be accessed in the highlands and islands. So it's a history, I would argue, of perceptions and of a change in context, changing reflections. But we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that perceptions means intangible. These perceptions have had substantial and tangible consequences on people and communities uh, of this place, but also the places and people who came to visit uh, as well and took away. Um, some of those ideas and, and impressions uh, as well. I mean, most famously, Romanticism with a capital R and that the impact that has had on how we perceive today parts of the Highlands and Islands, as well as other places like the Lake District uh, in England. So what can the study of history and the history of tourism bring to this debate? So I've just got a few possibilities here and it'd be great to maybe explore these and, and hear other, other people's thoughts. And um, so the first one is, in a, and again, you know, it's, it's Julian and Alex who are doing the cutting edge research here. It's about better understanding the context of contemporary thinking and expectations about traveling and tourism in the Highlands, both of the people who are coming to visit and the people and communities 
uh, places that they are visiting. And I think what Julian's work shows is that it, it can also lay the foundations for the co-production between communities of place and interest, um, tourists and travellers, and the agencies of tourism as well that uh, Steve's talking about. Um, so rather than um, those, those kind of perceptions and intellectual traditions being imposed upon communities and places, that they're, they're negotiated and discussed um, and, you know, something, I guess, something much more slow, but potentially exciting and sustainable uh, can come out uh, as a result. And I think we can all, we all know anecdotally the power of history or heritage broadly, broadly defined um, could have on that debate. Um, and I think it's, it, it puts that modern tourism, what we might think of over tourism or mass tourism, that it starts to put that into context and make those international links, which Stephen and his colleagues, uh, I think, are, are doing. Um, but also thinking or understanding about the historical ba basis of the appeal of this region to travellers and tourists and how that historical basis, that that first the aversion and then the sort of consumption of the sublime and the sort of landscapes, how that has affected this region's cultures, its communities, its economic development and politics. Um, so to, to, to kind of briefly kind of conclude and shamelessly steal Julian's uh, phrase, um, how, how those stresses and transformations, how those tensions can be negotiated uh, for potentially a more positive outcome, both for the people here, communities here, and those who want to come and visit and understand this place. So, Thank you very much, Annie. <clears throat> now, as one thing that struck me through all of the presentations, I'd be really interested to get the thoughts of all attendees here, both physical and online, is um, different reasons why people have come to the Highlands. There's clearly one, there's a dominant narrative in it, Annie's just outlined it very well, that emerges in the 18th and 19th centuries. But is that inevitable? Steve's outlined different factors that might, that are bringing people to the region. And I guess that's my question for all of you as speakers, but also maybe just one for people to consider who are out there. So I think enough of me talking. I wonder if there are anybody wants to pick up on that to start with, and then we'll have maybe pick up some questions after that. Does that sound okay to everybody? Nicola, is that, does that fit with your plans? Okay, great. So, anybody have thoughts on that, that question of why people come and are there alternatives to the dominant narrative that could work? Um, that's, well, it's just thinking of the way that a PhD um, unearths as many possibilities that you don't go down as it does when you do go down. And, um, and so the whole side of what tourists take away and what draws them there is less the focus of mine. And mine is much more on the experience of the inhabitants of the touristed place. But of course you end up absorbing um, a bit of everything, uh, particularly through living here, I suppose. I think with the North Coast 500 in particular, the selling point is, is landscape. Yeah. And um, tourism, has always been, and especially in the age of social media, um, a really visual phenomenon. Um, and what social media brings to the to the table is a, is a very democratized practice of photography and selfies and, and representation of landscape and of the tourist in the landscape. Um, but landscape in itself is a contested thing. So the landscape that draws the tourist here, which they engage with and which they perceive, might be very different from that which someone who lives there and associates that those same stones and earth and trees um, with people and memories and um, sometimes difficult heritages of dispossession, some of which are still ongoing today. Um, so I think sort of circling back to what um, Annie was saying, there's a, there's a possibility of drawing together those divergent um, relationships with landscape and putting them into conversation with one another. Cause I think there's a, there's a, there's a better way to do it than what we have right now. Um, and it's important that we, well, from my point of view, that we honor the inhabited perspective, but also that, that sympathetically engage with what tourists are actually, and almost always in a very genuinely good hearted way here, here to see. Uh, thank you for bringing out the visual. I think that's really, really 
can I pick up on just uh, just uh, and because one of the things I was thinking about recently was I was thinking about those kind of late eighteenth, early nineteenth century travellers who would come. Um, no photography at that point, but um, they would often um, paint watercolours, you know, go on kind of painting tours, keep detailed journals, which fortunately many were published that we can now kind of look at and use as evidence for social history. Um, and I think, you know, there was this kind of desire for, on the, on the part of those travellers, there was a desire to broaden their horizons, to educate themselves um, as part of a project of self-improvement, maybe with a capital I, so kind of linked to that, the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, as well. And I think that there's a kind of a slightly darker side to that history, which was they were also there to um, observe local communities and cultures and put them into a hierarchy as well. So um, a hierarchy where, yes, this they may be a purer kind of people and an uncomplicated society, like a noble savage kind of model, but there was a sense of superiority and inferiority implicit, I think, in much of that early travel writing about the highlands and islands. And it, I was sort of thinking, is it pushing it too far? <laughs> I mean, is, is, it, is there any remnant of that in modern tourism? I don't know. And historians talk about it as maybe like a colonial mindset as well. You know. um, but I think, yeah, so I think there, there was this attraction to the landscape and to the, the people and the cultures in a kind of idealized, romanticized way often. Um, and it's really, it's really travelers as kind of sharp and rude as Dr. Samuel Johnson, who actually comes at, you know, <laughs> the best view a Scotsman can get is the road to down to London, et cetera, et cetera. You know. um, so, so I think, I think there's, there's something in that, in, in that kind of deep, deep, longer history of, of tourism and traveling as well. But, I just, yeah, and, and you were, I was really interested in what you were saying about um, how appalled some travelers were about on highways in the 17th century, but others were, they find it very, very weird. And that's almost the appeal is they don't really, I find some travel accounts from the 17th century where they don't really make that judgment. It's just odd. I don't think it's particularly awful, actually. Um, and I've never quite found the right language to express that. Oh. Sorry, can I just, um, just when you're talking about Judson Boswell, so I studied that at UHI actually, and at the same time, I just happened to randomly watch Local Hero. <laughs> and the massive parallels between what yeah. was going on with this sort of condescending, jokey view of the eccentric Highlanders or West Coasters. And I just thought it was, it was a really interesting, as if that's still happening mm -hmm. in certain ways. Yeah. Even though Michael Forsyth is so sympathetic, he was still playing with that, that whole thing. Yeah. That's, I mean, I don't know what, I mean, do you think Outlander does that or is it just totally? Um, it's, it's really, it always depends whether people read the books or watch the show because it kind of it gives you different impressions. Like I said before, all the characters they speak in a central belt dialect, so people coming to Inverness are quite disappointed that there's not maybe the Glasgow kind of sounding language, and they're surprised that in Inverness you can actually understand people <laughs> um, if you just normally speak English. Um, but there's a bit when you when you said Sir Walter Scott before. I feel like personally that Dan Agarbalan echoes him a little bit. So it was first Scott that brought this idea of the romanticized Highlands, um, an English hero that goes to that Highlands in Waverley um, and all of a sudden makes friends with those savages that yes. maybe aren't as savage. Um, and the same thing happens in Outlander. Claire is an English woman that is on holiday in Inverness. And I think that's maybe what lots of travelers can kind of um connect to as well it's a bit more in depth than the books and it's actually described really well what the highlands were like just after the war but claire's husband frank who interestingly is a historian and quite interested in all the kind of jacobite history for his own personal ancestry the way he approaches it is this colonial view so he talks over the locals in the book so it's like um when claire asks what's this legend about Frank answers and doesn't let the locals speak that are around there. And he finds explanations of why the locals behave the way they behave instead of asking. I wouldn't say that it's nowadays with Outlander visitors or other tourists, 
Um, it's not as harsh, probably, but there are, Julian mentioned uh, social media, especially on Facebook, there are lots of groups, you can get great advice on travel. Um, and it's a good mixture of locals that like to share and uh, mainly um, overseas travel and not as much Europeans, I would say, um, more Americans and Australians. Um, who ask questions and then the locals reply, sometimes more or less annoyed. Uh, because if you read for the 15th million time, um, what's the secret spot that nobody goes to? The answer simply is, if there is a secret spot, the locals won't tell you because then it's not secret <laughs> personal anymore. But definitely Outlander brings visitors to Scotland. And then I think it's part, it's the task of the local and the local tour guides maybe to say, yes, the story has happened. And yes, Culloden Battlefield was part of this story, but also listen to all these other stories. There's so much more behind this. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm really passionate yeah, about it. In a way, it, it challenges some of the, the narratives. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes, I just, I, sorry. So, no, just, I was just interested in making yours and Steve's perspectives yeah. on that, because I guess self-consciously, the slow adventure tourism, you were, you were doing that or, or not? I, I was doing challenging a, a dominant narrative of. Life well, uh, well I, I, th I think in terms of the academic work, then absolutely. Um, and, 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 I, and I suppose we, we still are. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the opposite of, of what, uh, what we understand by the high adrenaline, isn't it? Really? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a historian, um, but so, I mean, I have a more contemporary take on this, but I mean, I just think about my own journey up from Fort William today, or from Glenfin. And you know, so so many different elements of of tourism I I saw on my way up. Some of them very traditional, and some of them very contemporary. Um, so you know, I, I would go past um, I would go past coach, coach tours, you know, and they'd be stopping off at a whiskey distillery. Um, they'd be going up Nevis Range in the gondola to, just to to look at the scenery. Um, there'd be people mountain biking. There'd be climbers. Um, a whole range. I came past Loch Ness, of course. Probably we're well, not going to say too much about Loch Ness, but um, and then I joined the NC five hundred. And and even just um, where, where I live, then um, yeah, there's this kind of heavily contested notion of of tourism in in, in Glenfinnan because obviously it used to be famous for for something, and now of course it's it's actually famous for, for Harry Potter more than anything else. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it, I don't have to go very far to 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 look at these these kind of issues, very contemporary issues, um, as to what what a tourist is and what a what a tourist actually wants. I think throughout time, there's just always this one narrative of the Highlands that takes precedence over everything else. So for a while, like you said, it was Harry Potter. So Edinburgh is still very much focused on Harry Potter. Then when Outlander came along, it kind of took over, but this time it addressed a different generation because the books were first published in the nineties um, and they were originally written for the middle-aged American housewife. Um, that's kind of how they were marketed in, in the beginning before it came out that it's actually really good historical fiction. It's adventure novel. There's pirates in there. There's literally anything you can think of. Um, it's all a bit like Forrest Gump. Um, Jamie and Claire meet any historical person of the time you could imagine. Um, they meet Flora MacDonald, George Washington, anybody you could think of. Um, but in kind of in if, if you want to look at it and criticize it, you can find it there, but you know, it's, it's also an interesting thing because people might be enticed to actually look it up. Who is this person or look up all the books that are being quoted. Um, but then Sir Walter Scott had this other kind of, like, it was this one perspective on Scotland. And I think what we should kind of strive for is kind of multiplying it and saying like, yes, there is, we have slow tourism, we have the NC 500, but we have great, um, like local festivals, there was the in the seaboard villages. What is it called? The Fisher Folk Festival. Fisher Folk Festival. Yeah. yeah. So that that's a great place to go and experience kind of local culture and see how people live. And I think this is the kind of thing that we should push more and say. Apart from Outlander, there's also all of this. Yeah. I think before we, that's a really interesting area of discussion. I wondered if there were any other comments or questions about these multiple narratives of tourism. The alternatives to the dominant narrative, whether they've existed historically. Um, sorry, I don't know your name. But no, I, mean, I came up with a line a few years ago. For me, Scottish tourism, Highland tourism, I had it culture, culture, and culture. And you've got these sort of three themes going that you've got that sort of Gallic, mythical, historical. Um, you've got the Walter Scott culture, all that bit. And, 
kilts and bagpipes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is culture. And there's also volume tourism and there's niche tourism. And I would suggest things like slow adventures, niche tourism. And with technology these days, I think that can be exploited much better uh, if you've got the right product. But you cannot stop the volume tourism as well. I think you just have to accept that then. Um, if I was going to do one thing, and I was an economist originally, was I would definitely start everywhere I go these days. If you're staying in a hotel, they're charging a small amount of money each night, which goes into local infrastructure and things like that. Now, that's a subtle way to get the locals on board because they actually see that they are benefiting from tourism, even if they're not immediately in the tourism business. I could go on, but I'll stop there. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, and I think um, maybe we can explore that. Any, any other points or questions? I think there's a, a slight danger with, with the narrative and, and the way that you're looking at things, because I think as all of you have mentioned, it has to come from community up, and I think it doesn't matter um, whether you're focusing on the outlander effect, slow tourism, which needs um, needs to be a much bigger deal in the Highlands than it currently is, um, or the NC 500, they're all going to happen and they're going to keep coming. And unless we actually go into the communities and start to encourage them to decide what they want as a community from the tourism, I think it, it doesn't matter. I mean, these conversations were happening in 2019. We had a break and we're now back here able to have these discussions. But in, the bigger picture is, is that we have to start with the communities and, and go back to them and find out what they want. On the Black Isle, we see it, Nicholas from the Black Isle, we see the south side of the Black Isle, which is full of tourists. The north side doesn't get anything. The north side would like some tourism, the south side would like a lot less. And they all go to one honey spot, they all go to Channery Point for the dolphins. And yet, on the Black Isle, there is a huge amount of, of historical and nature, um, venues that you could disperse people to, but A, they don't know they're there. Quite often the local communities don't know they're there. So I think the narrative has to start at, at a much, much lower level with the discussions. I, so that's the next area where we're going to move on to definitely agree with that. And if people are comfortable with that, I think I'd like to lead that into that question and you've been raised it exceptionally well. Uh, maybe panelists want to just respond to what you said. Um, well, I think there is a growing recognition um, about the, the need to uh, a balancing kind of community interest and the interest of, of tourists. Um, it probably isn't something that has been been done very much in the past, and um, you know, there's been this recognition recently that it's not just about it's not just about um, the bottom line. You know, it's not just about how much money we make. That we should be thinking about other ways of measuring how successful tourism is. Um, and I think there are a number of schemes in Scotland that. that um, I think it'd be held up as exemplars. I mean, I think in Western Ross, for example, they've, they've been working on a destination management plan, haven't they? Um, and I think that was the first of its kind. Um, and, and that was expressly trying to balance these, these different kind of needs. Um, and I think even down the road in Tain, I understand that there's a Easter Ross Peninsula, which is very much about community uh, level tourism, isn't it? It was, a, um, it was something that was put out to the community. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's a vehicle for we're involving a whole range of different actors and stakeholders in the community. Um, so I, I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, it is something that is needed. Um, and I think it needs, it needs a bit more policy direction, probably from, from the top and the, at the regional level as well. But I mean, there are definitely some good examples of things that are happening that, that are balancing these different, different needs. I think it's also a big um, responsibility of tour guides to take visitors to places yes they want to see they all want to see sky and the fairy poles and everything which is very full nowadays because it's just where everybody wants to go but doorknob where we are is a beautiful place and mm -hmm. it's part of the nc500 so it's got a bit more popularity but if you have a tour guide that um, takes the group where they want to go and then the rest of the half day or something says i want to show you one of my favorite places and it's this so if the, the guides actually pick up on kind of spreading out the tourism a bit more, sharing it. So maybe the north side of the Black Isle could also get some interest. You're absolutely right. And I come here with a number of hats on today because I'm part of the Black Isle tourism team. I'm also a tour guide. 
So I kind of see things from both sides, and, and you're quite right with that. Yeah. <laughs> other panelists or people here could um, maybe consider other examples of where local communities, local residents have influenced the way their communities marketed, where there have been a success story where they've actually been able to present a different version historically and in more recent times. I have an example, it's quite recent. So in Goldsby, they just installed a trail uh, for the Battle of Little Ferry, which was never spoken about. I didn't know anything about it. A lot of people didn't know when that happened the day or a couple of days before the Battle of Claudin. And that site obviously isn't visited as much as Clon Battlefield, and that trail is now there, and it was local people that put it together and shared the stories and worked with volunteers to bring that. But it's only just launched, so we obviously haven't seen the impact of that yet. And what was the secret to that happening? I think it was just a, a group of local people decided they wanted to share the story of Little Ferry, and they then had a celebration just when they launched this memorial stone that came from the local area. Was local people that put it together. I don't know if there are any questions out in DC, but I, I, I just any of the panel wants to respond. Well, to I was just, I was just, I'm sure Julian's writing whole chapters on what community means at the moment. But, and um, but I was struck by what you were saying as well, Alex, about because we have communities of place, the places of the Highlands of Ireland, but then we have communities of interest too. For example, Highland of Ireland, and so I suppose it's about a balance between catering between those different community needs and the fact, you know, so in a, in a way that's positive rather than extractive, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. Well, uh, you know, community is a, is a complicated notion. Um, one that we sometimes still associate with, um, notions of homogeneity that may never have existed, yeah. but particularly in the very cosmopolitan world of the Highlands today. In which there's people from every continent and all walks of life who are here for many different reasons. Um, community can never be a sort of overly simplistic thing. So I, I try and use that word. Um, like people say that what an ac academic does is take a simple thing and make it complicated. Yes, that's right. And they're usually right. And and that is that is the way I think about community. So I think one what my work has been is trying to um, emphasize the personal, which often brings out complexities that a sort of sanitized collective narrative can't. Sometimes there are uncomfortable things or contradictions within that. Um, but I at least personally find that quite a compelling um, way to take a simple story and make it give it some texture and 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 a and a, a story that's embedded in the details of, of one particular life. Um, so I think even we can even Take, go further down that funnel um, from community down to the, the level of the individual while still keeping that bigger picture in mind. Like terms in general, I think is really important. If you call somebody a tourist, it kind of comes with a negative mm -hmm. emotion with it. If you call it visitor, we have our tourist organization here is called Visit Scotland. They don't have tourist information, they have visitor information centers. So it's all a bit more accepting to the people coming here wanting to experience our country. Um, I, I mean, I say our country, both Julian and I, we're not native Scots. I'm originally from Germany, you're from America. So it's, um, we've been accepted into the communities that we've moved into. Um, but personally, in the in the small community that I used to live in uh, before I moved down to Glasgow, I was always the German lassie. I was never, you know, just the new person. Um, but even my boyfriend's family has moved up from Glasgow um, about 20 years ago. And it's sometimes still, you know, oh, they, they moved here. You know, it's, it, it isn't forgotten unless you've been born into it. So even just finding out who, who is a local, like when do you become a local? And I think we're gonna speak about this as well with holiday homes. If you live here six months, are you a local? Or are you, you know, still a visitor? Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, you <laughs> please yeah, go on. Now I was just gonna say that the view of the community, I've got several hats on as well. And I'm like Mr. Kirk from Yorkshire, but absolutely adore the Highlands and travelled here uh, on holiday for 30 odd years before being fortunate enough to to move here. I live in a seaboard community, I live in Port Mahomai, and I think 
you're only counted as part of that community if you are involved and if you contribute to that community. If you are not contributing and only seem to be to be taking and, and not giving, then no, you, you'll never be counted as part of that community and you'll never get involved um, in, in what's important to that community. And it is true, I've been guilty of swearing at tourists <laughs> in the NC500. There's lots of tourists in caravans and caravans have spoiled the NC500 for me, it's spoiled Assent and spoiled the North West because the infrastructure isn't there and people are going to the toilet in Lake Eisen. It's all that disgusting stuff that, that makes people in our villages um, who are normally extremely welcoming. I mean, I'm an English for him's sake, <laughs> and I'm really welcomed there. And like you say, we, we've got French, we've got Bulgarian, we've got Italians in a very small community, all contributing. But if the infrastructure isn't there to support visitors and tourists, you, you're bound to get conflict. Thanks for that. Um, Helen. Um, yeah, partly a follow on. I completely agree. Um, I kind of wanted to say that um, this is wonderfully civilized. He's all making me quite uncomfortable <laughs> um, because I I don't necessarily think that we need to be bringing more tourists. Out of it. I think there are too many tourists. I don't think the area is not really good. And I think we need to be talking about infrastructure. I think we need to be talking about legislation, about stop putting an end to the unregulated market in terms of holiday lets, Airbnbs. I think all of these things are hugely problematic. I think it's damaging local culture, local communities, I think it's damaging the environment. I think the transport network needs a huge amount of work. Everyone is driving up in cars, it's horrifying. These are huge and very practical problems, which is where we need to focus on. Yeah, that brings me to my next point, which is about we are academics. We work in a university here. Um, audience, some of you are, some of you aren't, but what should we be doing? What are we doing in order to address these issues? Other than talking about it here, what what are the key points? It's a challenge that I feel really keenly. Um, part of it's limited by the scope of a PhD. You know, three or four years is a long time in one sense, but it's very brief um, in other sense. Um, but how to take this out of the field of representation? What images get created and what people think, and into the, the field of concrete issues? Because, um, and I think one problem with the status quo is that no dramatic action is being taken. It's all piecemeal, you know, the Highland Council providing funds to reopen public toilets. It's these sort of piecemeal defensive measures or reactive measures, I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, there are huge structural problems at work here. Um, a lot of which have a, you know, to go back to the history, have real continuities with the last 200 years of, of the Highlands. Um, the concentration of land and power in few hands, um, the remoteness of decision making. Um, and so, uh, you know, as I look forward to the kind of work I want to be doing, it's about kind of refining my methods in ways that can be um, more clearly directed at social action, I guess. And this project um, is many things, it's a, it's a faltering half step towards that. And it uses words like participatory and collaborative, but but the, the way that I most feel like I'm falling short in a way is in terms of like what are the constructive outcomes of people's lives that I'm generating. And and that I think does raise, as, as David says, um, challenges that academics need to reckon with. Well, uh, that's us back to the UHI mission and our um, strategy in terms of having a transformational and transformational impact on the communities of our region and Surely, in an issue like this, there needs to be an application of, of research in a way that's useful. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to ask. I mean, from your perspectives, is it has this been something that's become intolerable in the last five years or ten years, or we're we talking twenty, fifty years? I mean, I've only been here eight, so I would maybe pass that one for someone who's been here for their whole life. Well, I mean, I can speak on my perspective. I've lived in Glenfinland for 10 years. Um, and I think in 2017, I noticed a big change. Uh, I think 
Um, it's, I mean, undoubtedly, it's a result of many different things. I mean, maybe it's, you know, uh, better marketing by Business Scotland might have been tied into films or what have you. But I think quite a lot of it was, was fallout from Brexit and devaluation of the pound and it, Scotland became cheaper yeah. um, as, a, as a place to visit. Um, and I noticed a big difference from 2016 to 17. And it's been the same every year since mm -hmm. since 17. Um, I mean, okay, we're all talking about lockdown. Um, but I, I think this year, is, I think it's going to be the worst yet. Or, or the best yet, depending on your perspective. <laughs> um, but I think it's going to be very busy, um, is, is my feeling. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think my, my, my experience was it kind of plateaued until until about 2017, and it really did take off. Um, it's been busy since. I mean, it's, it's sorry. Just, <laughs> Alex, quickly, and I'm going to mention, I want to make sure that people out yeah. in the DC have a chance to ask some questions, but Alex, please. I just quickly wanted to say I'm exactly one of those people that because of Airbnbs um, I could not find a better place to stay. I, I used to live out on Tarbert Peninsula where I had to drive everywhere. I wanted to go maybe to Inverness, maybe just a place where you know you can walk to the pub rather than having to drive and not be able to drink. Um, and it just A wasn't affordable as a full-time PhD student uh, and B there's also no jobs especially Tourism wasn't good enough um, at that point. I have done walking tours of MNS, about 60 of them over the past two years. Um, but if you do tours for just one or two people during a pandemic, that really doesn't keep you afloat. And if I can't afford um, living somewhere and then researching the area as well, how bad is it for somebody that literally just wants to live there? Um, and it was at that point, it was just me by myself. I didn't need anything big. I just literally I needed a bedroom kitchen or living room maybe so I wasn't looking for the impossible five bedroom house so I can completely understand this and I would love to live in the area if it's doable um, mm -hmm. without having to pay too high prices. And, and I think we have to say words like looking at degrowth as an option and that, um, that the logic of tourism as it's developed over the last 200 years but particularly since the rise of disposable incomes and, and mass mobility um, is based on a logic of growth, which we're seeing is unsustainable. The North Coast 500 has a, a map which links up with um, Galbraith's, the high-end real estate company. Similarly, Galbraith's is a map which links up with the North Coast 500 and promotes properties around it. And it doesn't take much of a leap to, to link the inaccessibility of the housing market for young people, for older people, for vulnerable people who are trying to live and work in the area to, to the dynamics of, of tourism. And it's a hard truth. I know that it's one that might make some people uncomfortable, but um, if you listen to local voices, that's what you're going to hear. And it's, and it's true. So. And it's not just here either. It's Cornwall, it's Devon, it's oh, parts yeah. of Wales. I mean, there's I'm probably all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. I used to live in the Lake District for a while. It's exactly the same now. It, it's part of the problem now that, you know, hospitality is, has got staff such shortages um, because there isn't any way for young people to, to rent in order to, to take minimum wage jobs. It's um, You've only got to look at Cornwall and the late district to see what might potentially happen. Yeah, and I think um, when people focus on Population expanding in the islands and islands, they're not they're thinking about one or two areas, and it's really not in other areas. It's, yeah. it's not providing sustainable populations, so something's gone badly wrong. Um, speaking of other voices, I'd like to open it up to people who are out there on the VC. I think we're going to do that through the chat facility. And I think Ian, I don't know if you have any questions or comments from the audience for our speakers. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, David. Um, I do. I hope you can all hear me okay um, in in the room down there. That's that's good. Um, not many uh, questions or comments coming in at the moment, but one from um, Hilary Robertson, great namesake there, um, but um, that 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 really does circle us back around in in the debate you guys have just been having um, on on a number of levels, really. Um, Hillary is um, involved with a community driven project. So straight to Julian's heart um, to establish a, a heritage center in the Trossachs. But she points out that the community um, is split um, between those accepting rising tourism promoted by the national park and um, seeking some economic benefit to the community from it 
and others, as um, we've heard today, um, others who feel tourism is exploitative and damaging. So there's that, that, that level of tension there Hillary is pointing out. Also very usefully reminds us that um, there is a strong spatial element to this as well. So there's tensions between the national agenda, um, the nation state agenda, um, the national park, for instance, and those are conservation tensions. Tensions between the national agenda and those that um, are on uh, the, 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 whose agenda is actually very much on the local and the local communal um, level. Tensions between the national park and locally produced um, action plans, for instance. So thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Really useful um, observation there. That's all I have for you guys at the moment, but perhaps some people, you know, this might generate some more comments, comments from the room and um, comments from the panel. Annie? It was in, yeah, thanks Ian and thank you Hilary as well. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, mentioning the National Park Sector, of course there is a, now a kind of a competition underway from the creation of new national parks, uh, including in, in this kind of Scottish borders and, uh, and elsewhere. It'd be interesting, I think, maybe to, to get your view, Steve, on this as a kind of slow, slow adventure tourism thing, but, you know, the those tensions, and we haven't spoken about them too much yet, but those tensions between um, kind of environmental and conservation um, agendas uh, and of volume tourism or, or mass tourism and, and how we try to balance those in a context of a climate crisis as well. So, you know, these, these places have always been long been valued for their landscapes um, and, you know, and not to beat about the bush, the fact that they're broadly unpeopled landscapes and that their rise in popularity come at the same time as the rise of a massive population boom, industrialization and urbanization. And there's there is certainly a relationship between these uh, these kinds of trends. Um, and so when national parks, I suppose, were first established earlier in the last century, um, first kind of specific reasons, do those reasons still speak to us today? Effectively or not. I just want to, to sort of say that we mentioned the adventure bubble, which at Adam Robin Dormant, we have a very similar issue here with, with the proposed new golf course. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, as a non UHR employee, I think hopefully we talk about this. So, it, it's just the same tension really between um, conserving an unspoiled area or exploiting it and I don't think necessarily that derogatory I mean it's economically and it splits the local community which on the side you're on makes creating tension for some other issues and, and yeah. yeah and do you think those have been exacerbated by the pandemic also those kind of divisions and tensions or is that not relevant? I don't know. Gordon Johnson all I was going to say of course, national parks is a different beast in different countries. So, you know, we've got a particular model in Scotland. The American model or something like that would be very difficult to replicate in Scotland just because geography is not as anything. I think one one uh, word that comes to mind when, I, when what you just said is is the notion of wildness, yeah. um, which is which has become a subject of a huge amount of debate yeah. recently. And um, wildness is one of those things which. Your first question is what attracts tourists to the Highlands. Um, I think wildness is, is often cited as one. Well. It's often promoted for its wildness. And yet you, you also have local voices who say this was, has, for at least 10,000 years, has never been wild. It's always been a people and managed landscape. Um, in a sense, regardless of the, the sort of factuality of whether or not it's people around people, it just shows different values being, being um, placed. And ones that are put under particular pressure because of the, the climate crisis. Um, yeah. So I think you're quite nice. Sorry. A really important point. The, the use of the term wild is so interesting and so divisive, and it's, it's employed in so many different ways. I, that's what I was just going to say. Like the whole idea of I'm going hiking in the wild area of Scotland, but then you, you drive there. Like you take your car <laughs> and go to a wild place. So either you park somewhere in a passing place so the next tractor can't pass or something, or you park in a designated parking spot 
but you still produced all of the CO2, you still used your car, you still have contributed to all of this. So I think what we have heard from the audience before, we need better train connections. Um, I mean, all of us had to travel to Dornoch, um, and I don't think a single one of us uh, came on public transport. Um, <laughs> just, just, like, just up to Inverness, but not Yeah, that, that's what I mean. I came that it came up from Glasgow. Um, I can easily take a train from Glasgow to Inverness. Then I can get possibly to Tain on the train, mm -hmm. but then I would have to wait. I think the next bus to Dornoch would have been 16 hours later after I arrived there. So this is just not sustainable. Um, if I could make it all the way up here, I would have no problem to sit on a train and actually do studying or working or something. Um, and I think for visitors, which then goes to kind of slow tourism as well, just sitting down and looking outside of the window rather than having to stop every 10 minutes, because look, there's another wild area right next to the busy A9. <laughs> I, I know of a few people who've, who've um, done or attempted to do the North Coast 500 entirely using public transportation, which is a slow adventure of a certain kind. Perhaps one that doesn't link with, with, um, with boutique products necessarily, but which, which gives a really interesting insight into the difficult geographies of this of this area. Um, and it's another example of where we need we need action in advance of demand, you know, rather than this kind of reactive. But we position. need that not just for the visitors, we need that for, for us too. Yeah. yeah. We're living here. I think it's it's always going to be an issue though, isn't it? Having public transport provision in, in the highlands. I mean quite a, quite a lot of it is underpinned by, by public money and you know, if, if if there isn't the demand there from locals and from visitors, then it's 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 really not very sustainable. But um, I, I agree that infrastructure improvements are are, are required, and um, you know we need to offer something else to the visitor really. Um, but that's that's going to be a, a, a slow journey to that one. Yeah. But then you know it's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's not the case in Scandinavia where very very rural locations have an amazing transport. Yes. Yeah, it's about councils. It's about someone stepping in and saying, actually, no, we cannot rely on capitalist demand. We have to solve this problem as a community. Because capitalism is not working. Yeah. <laughs> I think it goes back to that idea of providing for community first. If we can look at the infrastructure for the people who are already living here and get that right, then it's there for the tourists. And so, therefore, everybody benefits and I think that's where we need to start looking at the picture differently. You ask where can UHI come, you know, how can they play their part? The role of UHI up here I think has been absolutely fantastic and where you're not backed up is that we can study up here but then there aren't the jobs there um, for people to come out to. I have a 23 year old daughter who studied through UHI, she's living at home and the chance that she'll be able to move into the village that we live on the outskirts of and have somewhere yeah. is quite low. Um, but again, if we could if we could sort those kinds of things, plus our transport infrastructure, as we've already been saying, then you start to provide something better for the people who are coming to live to visit here as well. One one thing that struck me in this discussion has been how the audience, you you've all mentioned most of you mentioned specific examples, quite local examples. And is that really the solution? Is focusing on local solutions rather than an overarching bigger one? I just it seems to come up a lot. Because I wonder. I was just going to say because I was thinking about kind of 18th and 19th century infrastructure projects. So general wage roads or telphones, canals, and bridges. And I was thinking around here. So I can't drive. And so, um, I, but I did my PhD on Sutherland in the 19th century. So I basically spent a lot of time on the, the train and buses and post buses and kind people giving me lifts. Thank you, Nicola. Um, and, um, and, you know, so these were big, big infrastructure projects, state government funded, you know, like the British fisheries, creation of harbours and, and all that kind of stuff. That, and it feels like that, that the last of those infrastructure projects really sort of finished in about the 1870s, if you take the Inverness to Wickline, and then nothing's really been yeah. done since yeah. then, <laughs> you know. Well, the, the, the bridges, the bridges, bridges. bridges being a, a big one um, on the East Coast, yeah. but very much, and I suppose the Kyleskew Bridge in the West. And, yes. Um, yeah. But again, the based on the... a big difference. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, we used to have to coming up to Scotland in the 70s, 
when the British started appearing in the 80s. And it made a massive difference to the times between places and, and we've travelled all over the place because the roads have got better. That yeah. needed connecting up probably with the services because I can remember going to it the next one and shut at five o'clock. Is it? I think it's really important that we make a point just for because we have international viewers as well. We don't hate visitors like as a general notion. Um, it's lovely meeting people from all over the world. These are just this is the discussion that needs to be had in order for the hatred not to be built up as to, you know, I'm not talking to anybody foreign any more or something like this. So I think it's really important that we have this discussion. But I just want to make sure that people do understand that. We, we don't want to pull Scotland off, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, I mean, back to your question. I mean, I suppose communities, they're, they're so individual, aren't they? And their, yeah. their needs and their problems are so individual that, I mean, I don't think you can take a blanket approach, really. And I think that's that's why maybe, you know, mentioned Westeros, um, you know, look, they're looking at their destination management plan, that, that they have this idea and this vision, really, for, for what they want the area to look like in, in future. And I think it's probably going to take more of that kind of work at um, not not at a really local level, but yeah, certainly at a, a regional or sub-regional level um, to articulate what their own particular needs are. Uh, colleagues, can I can I jump in for a minute? We've got a we've certainly got a slew of comments on online, and and I feel the need uh, the need to share to share a few. So forgive me for a moment whilst I scroll back up to pick up the start of this. Um, there were, there, there's been quite a, a few lively comments um, around the, um, the question of scale and geography. Um, Andrea, for instance, reminding us very, very um, importantly that there are many different highlands. You know, there's, there's not just the one highlands that the NC500, you know, the, uh, the black sheep of this particular conversation um, seems, to, seems to mark it. Um, the, uh, the Andrew goes on to make a really um, interesting comment that I think Julian, you might want to pick up in in a minute. Um, in in terms, certainly in relation to your your PhD, pointing out um, the the speed of the the NC five hundred, the emphasis on movement and mobility, and a road trip makes it really hard for um, individual places to market themselves. I mean, I, I'd expand it beyond market to make themselves known, to make themselves valued, for instance, um, because you know people just want to to go to go straight past. So, so that you know that that takes, to my mind anyway, um, as to the heart of what your PhD is trying to 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 rationalise in a way. Um, and again, the comment about road trip is, you know, is it appropriate in the time of climate crisis um, and, and um, soaring fuel prices, of course. Um, but also from a much more historical perspective, we, we have a, a number of comments from um, Alison Munro, who, who makes the point, brings us back to the point about wildness and is, you know, was the Highlands ever wild? Um, you know, it, it, it it appears to be, but you know, it, it can also be understood as an industrial landscape, um, from wind turbines through hydro, sheep farming. They're they're all industrialized. Um, Alison suggests, um, and and she calls for um, a, a restoration of of the landscape, and perhaps that chimes very nicely with Steve's um, slow tourism approach. You know. Um, slow being generational tourism across a number of generations, not just um, one generation. And then finally, for now, um, oh, actually, we've got two more points. So, oh, gold three. Uh, sorry, is going up. I'll, 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 I'll leave the last two for the moment. But um, if you'll forgive me, I'll just pick up on Jill Barris's point um, from um, our chat and parish archive. Jill makes the point um, about. Um, the tensions between um, ancestral tourism and the reality of um, heritage for those um, who, who live and work within the Highlands. And, and of course, just for um, a bit of self-promotion, that is also the topic of another PhD student of mine, uh, Joe Rogers, who is looking at exactly those sorts of tensions and those sorts of issues um, on Tyree. Jill, so if you wanted more, I could put you in touch with Joe. 
but there's a good few points there. So um, perhaps back to the panel. Yeah, back to the panel. Mate. One thing that comes to mind there is um, about route tourism and the, and the mobility involved in it. I think of a picture that one of the participants in the case study in, in Assent on the West Coast took. Um, Assent, the, 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 the part of where she lives is, is entirely single track roads. Um, she is, she benefits from tourism. She has an Airbnb. She works at a shop, um, the one shop in that part of Assen. Um, But she also sees the negatives of it. And it's, it's one example of where qualitative research delivers insights that quantitative research can't. So um, while the number of visitors that are coming through her Airbnb has increased and her revenues have increased, the amount of labor involved is massively more because so many of these are one night stays and the amount of work that's required to, to clean all the linens and meet all the emotional work of meeting all these people. And, um, so that's, that's just one thing that came to mind in terms of the, the, the mobilities um, uh, involved in the North Coast 500. The other thing and it, is that it, it um, was originally devised as a way to kind of um, spread tourism more evenly away from the honey spots um, and to a region which perhaps hadn't seen as much of the, of the economic um, income that tourism brings as places like uh, Sky or uh, the Trossachs or, or, or what have you. Um, and yet a route also creates new peripheries. So one of my uh, case studies is in the seaboard villages of Easter Ross, which are located about 10 miles um, east of the A9, which carries the North Coast 500. Um, and so uh, they are now rendered kind of peripheral um, by this new route, which for some people is a benefit. It means that they don't, they're kind of spared some of the struggles that, that a place like Assen, um has seen more of. Um, but then you always get people who like going off route and, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and one example of a community that I think that's, I just happen to know quite well is that they have a really good, um, community organization there in the seaboard that has installed, uh, waste facilities for camper vans and is in, in the process of building a hard standing, um, where the revenues are going to the community and new public toilets and has a, a heritage center with a cafe and there's they're making the most of, of the situation i'd say so um is, is that knowledge being shared amongst other communities and are people having a chance to learn from what's being done there I think. well I, just from the audience members who wear many hats which have used that term um i think a lot of people are already really overstretched yeah um and that's just a reality of, of rural life right now um and so maybe the opportunities in addition to the the distance involved across the highlands, yeah. I've just thinking within the North Coast 500, but of course, we're looking at the islands and even further that sometimes it's, it's difficult, but I think that in a way, maybe the pandemic has, has brought more of a regional, like, or like collective understanding of these and, and through things like zoom, that there's more scope actually. I'd be interested to, we're going to have to bring the discussion to a close quite soon, but I'm interested in all social media, but before we get to that, Steve. <coughs> Touch a little bit on social media. Um, well, no, I was, I was just thinking you mentioned other areas and it's interesting that other areas of Scotland are actually wanting to emulate the North Coast 500, mm -hmm. aren't they, by the North East 250 and this one in the, in the borders as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do with slow, slow tourism, slow adventure is, is, is obviously to, to get people to, to dwell in, in individual locations and spend some time and spend some money. Um, and I mean, we've done a bit, a bit of work over, over near Gerlock and, and they were really, you know, concerned about how, how do they actually get people to stop? Um, um, you know, what, what do they have to provide? What kind of facilities, what kind of attraction, what, what do they have to do to get people to, to spend a bit more time, um, and move away from this kind of, um, well, colleague used to call it a snap and go. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, you know, obviously this kind of social media generation where, um, I mean, we see lots of you know, coach parties, they stop at one place and yeah, everything's quick, take a photo and then move on. And, and that's, I mean, that has its attractions for lots and lots of tourists, I'm sure, but I mean, that's not really what we want to, to be, to be doing, not from a community level. Um, it's, it's definitely about getting people to, to actually spend a bit of time. I mean, and there has been talk about, you know, oh, well, 
uh, you know, people go around the North Coast 500 and then they'll come back again and they'll spend some more time. And uh, whether that's actually true or not, I don't know. There probably are some statistics to, to, to back up an element of that, but it's, it's that kind of, that kind of ethos, I think, and moving, moving people away to, to, yeah, less trammeled areas. Um, I guess where, where they would actually welcome a bit more, a bit more development. Um, that I think, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a, quite a task there. Um, really to to address all of these things, but um, yeah, you mentioned the social media. I mean, I can't touch that. I mean, I, I, yeah, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not big on social media. Um, but but basically, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it, it it can have a positive role in terms of you know user generated content, great for, for businesses being marketed by their consumers. But I think that, yeah, there's also a fairly fairly insidious kind of uh, elements to that as well that you know maybe somebody else would would want to touch on. Well, in, in terms of Outlander fandom, the <laughs> social media is absolutely massive. Apart from the fact that like, I retweeted an event that only marginally has to do with Outlander, so we're not having an Outlander discussion. And the fact that we got 21,000 impressions within a week, that kind of shows you how much you can get if it's actually a pure Outlander event. Um, and there is, in Inverness, for example, there is a fan group called Inverness Outlanders, um, like proper actual, we meet once a month and take minutes and everything. Um, apart from the fact that it's nice to talk to other fans um, and it's this like, sense of community, you're part of something, they're also kind of really interested in um, broadening the horizon of people. So they've now kind of worked together with Visit in Renes Loch Ness, the kind of tourism centre there, um, to say, you know, this is, this is part, we're part of the story and we kind of, we need to pick it up but then spread it out again and not just, you know, not just centre it around this one graveyard in Inverness where you can see history left over. Um, and that's kind of what I personally was trying to do with my tours. I would, of course, go to all those sites, but then also stop and point out, look, here's, you know, here's the, the issue with all the new hotels being built. They don't fit into Inverness. They don't look nice. Um, but there's other great places you can go. If you have a day, why don't you go up? to let's say door up and you know spend the day there actually like make use of the businesses there um and then also send them inwards and not just around the coast um so i would say social media can take a massive part of this but it has to um it has to be somehow structured <laughs> so what inverness islanders are doing they're retweeting lots of local events local areas um if there's um, a reading about a book, um, especially concerned with topics that Outlander touches upon, they will retweet this and try to get people to get to go to those sort of events and take a minute and actually stay and watch something rather than just take a picture at the Fraser Stone on Culloden Battlefield and then run off again to Clavacairns and that's them done within Rennes area within half a day. Um, so what we do want is people, if if they're coming, to actually stay and experience what we all like about our country. So dwell and move around a bit rather than slap and go. Gordon and then Helen, I think, wanted to come in. I think you want to come in very briefly. We're going to have to yeah, very briefly. Well, this is just good chat. It's like maybe it's not a good idea at this time. But then <laughs> we haven't talked about rewilding and these new green big landowners as well. The implications of that might be, I mean, it's quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, I haven't talked that much about the conflict between making money out of tourists from accommodation and lack of housing for locals. Uh, and I'm not sure if the history unit in the UAI isn't involved, but Inverness had this problem, what do you do with that fake castle on top of a mound that's really Fort Roman that's listed, and they're doing something quite massive. They got a large chunk of money from the Scottish government. I think the idea is to sort of be quite truthful, they hope, and to spread people about. But I know not much more than that. But you've got all this coach, where the coach is going to park, and what's going to happen to Inverness. But are they going to succeed? Is that the way to go? Because I'd rather be out in the world rather than a building in Inverness. You're absolutely right. As soon as I heard about that, I said that. We've got to be on the advice. We've got to create an advisory group for it. I wanted to be on the delivery group, and I got myself onto that. I'm limited by the amount of time I spent it, but I found it really valuable and really interesting. The discussion that's taking place around that topic. Um, Helen, and then um, well, I was going somewhere similar. I want to talk about rewilding and land reform, um, and to tie that into social media. I think a lot of the kind of this 
uh, excruciating romance that has been there historically is coming out on social media now in terms of trying to present a sort of good life ideal that is in fact uh, not really the whole story um, and to talk about the world and without considering the complexity of what that might mean for the communities and how we intercept that with industry and so on. And I think social media is simplifying and romanticizing a lot of these problems in quite a healthy way. Uh, but like before, community buyouts, I mean, these things have to be able to fail. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> we were asking about communities and do, do the communities talk with each other? Do they know what's going on? There's a really good um, program that began um, 2019 with the run by the Social Enterprise Academy and Islands and Islands Enterprise, and it's called Communities Leading in Tourism. And that goes right, it takes um, cohorts from right across Scotland who all come together. And I think it ran, the first one ran for five months and were able to share ideas. Um, and these weren't necessarily people who were already in the tourism industry. They were from community groups and organisations coming to see what they could do for their community and look at what other people are already doing. So there are conversations yeah. out there. I think that's a nice, a good optimistic note to, to draw things to a conclusion on. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, the, the aim of our event today was, was twofold. Really. One was to present some of the research that's been done by researchers within UHI. I'm really proud of that and really glad that they came along. But the other was to hear voices from people who aren't involved in academia and think about ways that we could talk together. Inevitably, that leaves vast areas untouched. <laughs> I was daunted by that, and I knew that this would be the case. Um, hopefully, that does that may be frustrating for people, but I hope it doesn't end discussion. And if this can start discussion, then that would be a success. I just wanted to thank our speakers, um, all of you, for presenting things so concisely and live in a, such a lively way, and really for generating such excellent thoughts and really really interesting discussion and also to everybody who's attended both of you, those of you who are here face to face and those of you who are out on the PC over there uh, really appreciate it um, just one thought to end on we we enjoy the hospitality of the hospitality students here before we were at this meeting who made the sandwiches we share this building with uh, professional golf students and hospitality students and we would be great to see more of them um, staying in this area after they finish their their, uh, their qualification UHI is a tertiary university. We have higher education students and further education students, and it's really excellent to see all that happening in a small way in this building here. So thank you to everybody, and thanks to Nicola and to Ian and to Alison and all the other people involved in organising this who played such a huge part in it. And as I say, I hope that's a starting point. I hope we uh, weren't too comfortable, but we managed to get it to people thinking about the less comfortable things as well. So thank you, all of you. And I hope to see you again, actually, in the autumn. We start our History Talks live series again in September. I think it's me who's speaking. It I is. Remember, but, I think <laughs> you. Um, but yeah, we'll have a whole host of talks and hopefully more roundtables like this. It's the first time we've used this space. I don't think it will be the last because I think it's, from my perspective, it's been really, really good place to have a discussion. So thank you to all of you. Thanks to you. See you and uh, lots of thanks from uh, from online as well, folks. <laughs> Can I just ask, is anyone driving down to Inverness anytime soon? <laughs>